What is up, GBA people? Welcome back to week two of the Power Rankings. My name is Aster. I am officially replacing Rob. Unfortunately, Rob had to leave us for Power Rankings. He's still going to be around for Pick'em Crew, so you guys are going to be able to keep up with him there. We do wish him good luck in his future endeavors, whatever he may do. Uh, but uh, this week, I am back again with, of course, my co-host, the vegan himself, Jar. How you doing? Sadly, I think we'll, this isn't the last we've heard of Rob for us in general, so, you know, yeah. we'll see him around. <laughs> How's but uh, what's up, guys? Jar here. Um, Aster is going to be joining me, so very happy for that. But uh, I just want to address something real quick, because I know a lot of you don't actually watch the power rankings. You skip around uh, and see where your favorite teams are ranked and where all the teams are ranked. Um, so just pre-note, this week was actually hell for me and Aster, because the coaches... Yeah. Let me just give you an example. There are 12 one and one coaches, so we basically have to rank... I believe those 12 teams just off of nitpicking basically so this week's rankings are a little iffy week three will be a much better decider of where the teams are actually ranked because we'll have some different different we'll have some different records at that point but for now we're kind of in a rough spot Aster yeah it's extremely difficult like Jar said but uh, we're gonna try to get through it and we'll start with our number 16 this week we have Tup and the Pittsburgh Piratitas at number 16 we saw the game um, Tup a couple of crucial, uh, I think, prep errors and uh, a few misplays during the game as well, which really cost him. Uh, initially, uh, not prepping enough for Miltank. Miltank put in a ton of work uh, for Mono. He really knows how to use that thing, and Tup was not ready for it at all. I was just able to body him completely, uh, able to get up rocks, which cost Tup two of his Pokemon. Uh, right off the bat, I got uh, two of the kills, even though those don't count for Miltank, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he overprepped for, I believe it was Mantine and Florges. Uh, he did say it in his commentary. Uh, he didn't spin away the rocks when uh, the switch out of Zygarde was extremely obvious, even though he was choiced uh, on his Cryogonal. Not getting rid of those rocks was extremely crucial for him later in the game. He let things take damage that he shouldn't have. Uh, the Scarfed Roserade was, was really good on Mono's part, but I still feel like Tup didn't put in the... Uh, the correct prep this week uh, didn't predict the right things to come uh, it's kind of difficult that is what league formats all about uh, but we do have him down at the bottom why do you have him at your number 16 as well yeah i don't want to give tup too much crap for this game because in my opinion he had a very very horrible matchup and he went up against probably one of the best players in the league as we've addressed before um, but I mean, I have to agree with you, some, some issues with this prep and play, I mean, Nido King forced to be his rocker again, and like, I've said it before, I'll say it again, Nido King isn't the greatest rocker, it's very frail, and it can get one shot quite easily. I don't think his choice of hyper offense was bad this week, I just think that he didn't bring a wall breaker, and Mono was able to switch her, because he just brought Scarfers, so Mono was able to switch around his team so easily, and if, if Zygarde had ever gotten to plus one, it was over once Cryogonal took that damage. Luckily, I don't think Mono was Dragon Dance, but I mean, yeah, just those issues with prep, I mean, on top Sand that you just, you have to do a little bit more. Uh, also with his play, I mean, again, bad matchup, but when you are in the hole and when you're going up against a good player like Mono, it's hard, but you have to make aggressive doubles and predictions to get into the game, and Tup just didn't do that. He played very straightforward, and like you said, Mono just capitalized on him. Mono is not gonna choke a game like that away, ever. Yeah, the big thing, like I said earlier, that really frustrated me was not going for the rapid spin when you're in front of a Zygarde with a Cryogonal. There's no way he's staying and keeping in his Zygarde when he has a very safe switch in. But Especially when Tup did not bring a Zygarde switch in. It literally exactly. probably two-shot everything on that hyper-offensive team. Pretty much. So, yeah, that's uh, that's why Tup lands down at our number 16. Uh, we do also have the same number 15. Uh, if you want to go go ahead and talk about him, we are going to get a lot of heat for this one, but I think it's well-deserved. Uh, I mean, here's the thing, guys. Uh, like I said, there's 12 one on one teams, so if Dan is 0-2, we really don't want to have to mix him in with the one on one teams as it is. We already have such a large pool to nitpick through, so I want to see Dan win a game before I start moving him up again. I know he has the potential to do so. He's a solid league format player. He can win. So. I, I want to see Dan win, and I know he can win, but just a few things like this week, again, that made me, like, question, like, his prep. I mean, he's brought, he basically brought three of the same exact sets as he brought in week one. The Clefable was basically the same with, I think, one move changed out. Scarf Victini, uh, it was physical, but I mean, Scarf Victini is Scarf Victini, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's pretty predictable at this point with Dan, and I believe the, uh, an another one, I don't remember what the third Pokemon was, but I remember counting three sets, but, I mean... The, like Dan said, the Weavile Poison Jab was obvious, but he didn't prep for it. Maybe a Kebia Berry with Moonblast Ice Beam would have been better if you were that scared of Landorus, and Landorus did end up putting in a lot of work on him. But I just think that 
you know, Dan didn't, like, predict correctly. He brushed off what Duncan could bring and did not prep for Sun at all. Uh, when you look at Duncan's team up and down it, like, his only Victini switch in is Torkoal, so maybe run a special Victini, because in my opinion, special Victini, that Scarf puts in way more work this match than a physical one, because once you get that minus one speed, you're about to get Pursuit Trapped by his Weavile, which he used last week. So, I just don't think his prep was, like, all that good. Maybe a little bit of the Shady problem. I want to I want to see just Dan win a game before I move him up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think we discussed this matchup uh, before making our picks in Pick'em, and uh, I made it very clear that uh, Victini had a very good matchup and that um, Duncan didn't really have a lot of very good switch-ins to it outside of Torkoal, uh, which did come to this game. But I think Duncan, all, all credit to Duncan, and we'll get to him in a minute, but all credit to him, he played a, a very solid game, and Dan uh, made a couple of really big missteps early in the game with his Electros, uh, and with his Terrakion. Terrakion was his biggest win condition. That thing could straight sweep through Duncan's team, uh, and he let it go down way too early. Uh, later in the game, Toxapex went down. That was literally his only check left to Weavile, the only thing that could decently take it on. Uh, he switched it into a Venusaur as it got up its setup. He brought Haze, very good prep, but it still got two shots, so ultimately it didn't really matter. Uh, the Sun was a great bring on Duncan's part. Uh, again, Dan, Dan didn't play horribly. He didn't prep horribly either. I think uh, I want to see a little bit more creativity. Like you said, a couple of his sets were very similar to last week. I think the third one that you wanted to cover was maybe Terrakion, even though it was no longer a subset. It was it was Rock Polish three attacks. But uh, no, I think I think Dan uh, has it in him. We've seen what Dan can do in the past. He's He's been in finals. He's won a championship. Uh, he he had a great run in VGC recently. Like he's a very great Pokemon player, uh, and I know that he'll bounce back. But we have to keep him down this low because of the two losses. So unfortunately, he is our number 15. Uh, this is where we're gonna land him. So uh, yeah, I just I, I completely agree with you though. Like playing too aggressively with Mons that were crucial. Electros, Terrakion, Force Stand to get overly aggressive, and Duncan capitalized. What can you do? You know, I mean, Duncan even said it during his commentary. He was doing a live com, and he's like. He needs this. He's not. He's gonna switch out of his Terrakion, and he did, and he got the U-turn momentum with his Landorus, with his Scarf Lando, and from that turn on, it would just went all downhill. Duncan kept all the momentum throughout the game. It was just impossible for Dan to, to work his way back. So, unfortunately, that's the way. Uh, that's the way it played out. But uh, again, like I said, Dan. Dan is definitely gonna bounce back. We're gonna see good things from him this season. I'm sure. Uh, it, Dan d rarely has a bad season in any league he plays in. We've seen it in other leagues that he's in. Uh, he's he's a tremendous player, and I'm looking forward to see what he can do. Uh, from definitely, here on out. definitely. Yeah. But Moving I on. Think, yep, we'll move on. I'll take this one. Sorry. Yeah, um, go for it. We agree again. Number 14 is going to be Magnitude Steve Battler X. The whole association is ranked at number 14 <laughs> this week. Battler X asked to talk about him for a minute. Yeah, um, <laughs> Steve. Steve once again. Fant or Battler X, excuse me. Fantastic commentary. Uh, great reactions on his part. Uh, I think Roar. I, I wasn't as surprised as him to see Roar on uh, on on the Tyranitar because Tyranitar is one of um, Como's biggest setup targets, uh, and you should be looking for your opponent's phasing options or hazing options. Like John brought his hazing Milotic Week One, Dan with his hazing uh, Toxapex. You should be looking for Mons that deal with setup before you start bringing things like Belly Drum Salak. Uh, it, it was a great bring on his part. It could have done a lot of work, but it's it's somewhat predictable. Uh, I, I understand it was a great prep on Callum's part, not to take anything away from him, uh, but I think that Steve should have seen that coming. That lost him a lot of momentum. Uh, Mimikyu was cute too. Uh, the baby doll highs, uh, kind of weird set on his part. Uh, I like the way that he let his Cresselia uh, go down to chip away at the Tyranitar, uh, hoping that he would be able to sweep with one of his sweepers later in the game. That was good play from Steve. Uh, nothing nothing bad about him there. Uh, and Steve is 1-1, one one, of course. Uh, we have him down at number 14 because of the Haxi win uh, in week one, and uh, just not a super strong showing this week. Uh, I think uh, the Cartana could have done a little bit more work. Uh, Espeon did live. That was a great set on his part with the Cartana with the uh, with the increased speed I love to see that uh, when you go uh, I think it's 19 IVs and uh, what is it a timid nature yeah it's the gypsy set yeah the gypsy set and uh, he, he brought the speed boosting Cartana which was fantastic on his part um, Callum didn't see the uh, I mean he had enough 
um, investment on his Espeon to be able to take the Night Slash. Obviously, because of that timid nature, Kartana was not able to knock out the Espeon. Kartana could have put in a lot of work in the endgame, and it might have been extremely difficult for uh, Callum to win the game from that point on, but Espeon did win. Uh, Maximilian it was, it was Sash Espeon, so it wasn't a roll or anything. Oh, okay, it was Sash. Yeah, it was Sash Espeon. I didn't see his team builder. That's okay. why Callum went into it, yeah. All right, fair enough. Uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, not, he, not really Maximilian Pegasus. Uh, Battle Rex, that's that's not who your opponent was this week. Uh, I think Callum played a fantastic game, and Steve uh, Steve needs uh, to. Uh, unlike all the other coaches, I think he needs to tone down on the creativity a little <laughs> bit uh, and uh, bring a little more uh, standard, a little more not not. I, didn't, I was about to say creative, uh, not creative sets, but just uh, things that work against productively your innovative. Yeah, pr yeah exactly, uh, efficient. Uh, so I want to see more of that from Steve. I know that he can pull it out. So uh, I want to see uh, I want to see what he can do in the next couple of weeks. But we do have him down at number 14, the lowest one in one of the pack. Uh, as you guys are going to see, yep. we have a lot um, of those coming up. So go well, ahead. I'll tell you, you this, Aster. Steve is number one in my fun rankings. In your fun but, rankings? <laughs> but we don't get to make a video on those. So yeah, unfortunately, he's extremely entertaining. There. He's extremely entertaining. <laughs> also, honestly. I did the rules analysis video for the GBA, and nowhere in the list I was given was magic or millennial items banned. So I'm afraid we can't use that as an excuse for him well, this week. Well, there you week. go. Yeah. Yeah. So that's rough. But overall, <laughs> Steve had some really cool prep. The car, the car. Sorry. The Kartana set was cool. We've obviously seen it before. It was it's a very good set, very mm -hmm. terrifying. Uh, Zorark Crest Synergy was cool to help deal with T-Tar. It did not work. But Steve hasn't brought his first round pick and his Z-Mon, I believe, to yeah. any battle so far. Yeah. And I find that just hilarious because I think he's the only person to not do that. Yep. But <laughs> um, I think we kind of saw how why Kartana is maybe not as good in league format as it might be on the ladder because it's still solid but when it's not a Zemon it does have trouble breaking things that are just a little bulkier people can run a sash with HP that, fire yeah sash HP fire that yeah does the right shaman there. completely walled out the Kartana it could not two hit or I don't even think it could have three hit KO'd it um don't completely agree with the shaman set Callum brought but we'll get there but do not Steve ever trade Crest for a T-Tart when a drill is around and can two shot the rest of your team besides that that was not a good trade on your part. Well, but... I mean, if he, if he, he he was prepped for it, he was he was ready to to sweep through it with the the Como, and it didn't end up working out for him. So yeah, there definitely did not. But I mean, you sack in your counters on a team that has no counters, and it, once Callum, once the crest went down, Callum was just able to, like you said, play really solidly, just not make a huge predictions. The roar on T tar. I mean, he basically didn't need T tar at that point. I thought yep. it was more just a sack, uh, don't risk the setup kind of situation. Not really a prediction, but. Yeah, overall, very, very solid from Callum. Steve, I, I agree with most of the points you made. Maybe just a little more productively innovative, but we will see what he can do in the future. But for now, we're going to have to move on. So you want to talk about our number 13, which we also share? Well, I started on Steve, so I'll let you start on uh, on Duncan. Um, but we did uh, touch on his match a little bit. Uh, so if you want to go ahead. Yeah, so the reason I have Duncan low is because he is one in one team who beat a team we both have at 15 in the power rankings. So... I, I don't want to say the wind is like a little less uh, crucial, but it's definitely like a win you can take a little bit from. But he's not this low because his play was bad or his prep was bad. I It was a little bit rushed, and I know Envy did a lot to help him this week, which <laughs> yep. makes me want to put him a little bit lower because I want to see Duncan be innovative and creative like I know he can be. He's a very creative guy when he wants to be. But I just can't move him up this week. If he wins next week, he will shoot up. But it's just I, I don't see another team I want to put below him at this point. Uh, trust me guys, if Duncan wins next week, he'll move up, but like I said, prep was just a little rushed. I, I really don't like the fact that he's kind of putting it off to the last minute because that's how you lose games. It obviously worked out for him this week because he had some help, but it, it worked out. Um, I thought the prep he did come up with in the end was solid though, maybe getting a little too comfortable because I believe it was Scarf Landers last week, but he is proving it is still as big a threat even without sheer force, which is really impressive in my opinion. But, like I said, he played really well. When Dan sacked his uh, things he needed to wall his team, he took advantage and he just capitalized. And I, I don't really have too much to complain about. Like I said, uh, a lot of people played really well this week. Uh, a lot of people played really well week one. It's just impossible to do rankings this week. Yeah. Hey, hey, uh, hey Jar, uh, where, where, where's that Mandibuzz? I, I don't know, man. <laughs> does, does he have a Mandibuzz? I'm not sure he has a Mandibuzz. I thought I he, he I heavily he relied. I don't think he drafted Mandibuzz. 
I I, th I thought he heavily relied on Mandibuzz. I, I I don't think he drafted a Mandibuzz Aster. I think you're mixing him up with another team. Yeah, I, I don't know who said that. But anyway, uh, moving on to uh, our number 12. Well, my number 12 and your number 10, actually. This is where we start to have a few disagreements. But again, like we said, guys, it's going to be extremely difficult to uh, to get everybody in, in the same rank uh, because there are so many one in one teams. So again, like Jar said, we're just nitpicking at stuff at this point. Uh, but we'll talk about Tom first. Uh, Take a Tom, shot every time they say how hard this week's rankings are. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or how how often you say you're a stall player or a vegan now. Uh, but Tom, the San Jose Sharpedos up against uh, Cooper and uh, the Utah okay. Jasmine. Uh, oh, we're talking week. about Tom, you're 12. Okay, okay. Yeah, my 12, my 12, <laughs> you're 10. Uh, but yeah, Tom, uh, I think Tom put in the, the right prep this week. That's why we moved him up so far. Remember, guys, he was uh, at number 16. He did win this week, so we, we are moving him quite higher up. Uh, he found a way to make his team work. Uh, I personally thought he had a good matchup. I, uh, I voted for him in Pick'em as well, uh, and I thought he really uh, did have a good matchup, and he proved it. And he showed what he could do with his Mons. You have a lot of extensive notes on this matchup. I kind of just yeah. breezed through it. Uh, I saw that he was able to use his Vaporeon very, very well as a Spadef wall. Able to trick the Reuniclus, keep it from setting up. He's able to control Cooper a lot, so if you want to go over that. Yeah, no, Tom really, really impressed me this week. I have him up at 10 because uh, he did put in a lot of work. Very nice prep, very solid play as well. Um... I do want to address, I, when I was talking about, because I made the point in the draft analysis about how Tom's physical offense was lacking, I was yeah. more talking, I, I will take my English there, it wasn't very good, but it was still over an hour long video that, you know, I couldn't cover every single little thing, but what I was kind of trying to say was, I didn't know if the combination of Hitmonlee, Zygarde Dog, and uh, Incineroar could carry the physical load just because they're such frail mons, that's not debatable. They can be one shot very, very easily and two shot by almost anything. Incineroar so, is not frail, Jar. It's Incineroar typing frail. makes it frail, Aster. Yeah. Yeah, it's got, <laughs> it's a lot got of so many weaknesses and it's weak to rocks. So that's that. So far though, on that point, he has proved me wrong. I agree with you, he did have a pretty good matchup this week, but I mean, the Reckless Life Orb Hitmonlee, that is a wall breaker, and I mean, if the Hippowdon had clicked EQ, it would have died, but luckily it didn't, so it was able to pick up a few more kills, but he is prep, solid. He chose the right strategy. Cooper's got a very slow team outside of Swellow. Bring a Life Orb Hitmonlee, two-shot every single Mon on his team. That was very good. Trick Guard, I mean, Obvious, yes, but he had nothing for Reuniclus besides that, so very necessary, and he per he went for it at the right time. You saw Nito forced to be a rocker again this week. We'll see if that creates a problem for Tom in the future. I don't know if it will. Nito is a very solid rocker, but I'm not sure he's ever going to get it to use it to its offensive capabilities, maybe as much as he can. Yeah, I would have like I would have liked to see him put a little more investment in special defense in his Nito Queen because it was not able to hit, eat special hits at all, nor from the Zapdos. Uh, the uh, the Swallow was a little bit obvious; it would probably go down anyway from the range it was at. Uh, but if it could take two hits from the Zapdos, I would have liked to see that. Uh, he was forced out pretty early, so uh, just be careful with that. I know that he he didn't want to go for the special defense this week, but you can always you can level out your defenses. So I would have liked to see that. But other than that, Tom did an amazing job. So. Yeah, I mean he made all the plays he needed to. He used vape. As a great pivot, he went for trick with guard at the right time. The double into Hitmonlee was mm -hmm. where he just put the knife into the game right there. That was the play that Cooper basically, I think, lost the game right there. And Cooper, you know, I, I'll get to it a little bit later, but he's, I don't think he just, like, capitalized on Tom. But Tom made the plays he needed to to win this game. And I have to give him a lot of props for that. Great job. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you want to start us off on uh, Geo? Yeah, so I have Geo at number 12. Oh, I have Geo at 12, I believe. You have him at 11, is that correct? Yes. All right, so the reason I have Geo at 12 is because I, he got 6 0 <laughs> Yeah. It's the first 6 0 of the year. I mean, definitely some hacks involved in that 6 0. But I don't think this game turns out differently in the end if the, uh, if the Magneton dies to that Focus Blast from Heliolus that he unfortunately missed. But, I mean, you just saw it at pre Team Preview. Look at Geo's team. Look at uh, Crimson's team. Cobalion was going to sweep him. He did not prep for it well. He got a little too caught up in Entei, which did not come. And But, like, his prep was solid, but, like, you just look at his team. He's got the definition of a Cobalion setup fodder in Umbreon. Since Magneton was alive, it was way easier to get into it sooner. So that's why I think it was a 6 0 instead of maybe a 3 or 4 0, I think it would have been if he had hit the Focus Blast. But it also revealed a gigantic weakness in Geo's team to electric types that I kind of figured out after talking to some friends, but not during and before recording the draft analysis. But 
Just very, very unfortunate miss that cost him huge. And his prep wasn't the greatest. I mean, Arcanine can kind of wall uh, Entei and um, can wall Cobalion. Because a plus one after the Intimidate, uh, 252 Stone Edge from Cobalion to a defensive Arcanine does about 55 to 65. So you're even living it after rocks. And a Fire Blast from Uninvested does 95 to 113. So I, I don't think he prepped for the things he needed to. I think he needed Arcanine in this game, and since it didn't come, it was just way easier for Crimson to set up with Cobalion early and just get the momentum he needed and just win the game pretty easily, pretty solidly. So I want to see Geo bounce back. I think next week we'll say a lot about how his season will go, if he can bounce back from the 6-0 or not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a few, uh, like you said, Arcanine not coming, uh, that makes a lot of sense now that I think about it, because uh, that Magneton wouldn't have been able to freely switch in as often as it did. The miss uh, from the Focus Blast definitely cost him, but I think it only cost him differential in the end. Uh, I would have liked to see perhaps Thunder Wave on Ferrothorn, maybe Earthquake, something to deal with the Cobalion. Like you're, you're I think it only gets Bulldoze. It, yeah, well, okay, Bulldoze would have worked too. You know, it's a combination of Thunder Wave and, and Earthquake right there, <laughs> uh, lowering its speed gradually. But like something, something to deal with the Cobalion at the very least. You know, uh, he he had absolutely nothing for it. He, and he just let it set up on that Ferrothorn. Like. Yeah, he just kept Gyro Balling. He didn't really have a switch at that point because it went for Swords Dance first. I guess he could have gotten into Finny first, uh, knowing that he couldn't knock him out even with a plus two Stone Edge. Uh, but then again, there's the, there's the threat of Iron Head. I mean, the flinch, uh, Iron Head flinches. So uh, I think Geo just didn't bring what he needed to bring, especially the Arcanine. That's that's the biggest thing uh, that prevented him from being able to uh, to shut down uh, both the Magneton uh, by being faster than it, and both and also the Cobalion uh, being able to intimidate it repeatedly. So uh, big. Uh, Big drop for Geo this week, unfortunately. I have him at number 11. You have him at number 12 is really just a little discrepancy there. But uh, ultimately, we, we need to see uh, better performances from Geo. He had a, he had a solid week one. Uh, I'll give him that much. Uh, but yeah, he, we, we, we need to see better than 6 O's, man. <laughs> <laughs> just just a little. You know, maybe a 5 0 here, a 4 0 there. Just no 6 O's. No 6 O's. Yeah, for sure. Uh, moving on, we are going to cover Gator next, I guess. Yeah, I, I believe. I, yeah, I have Gator at eleven. You have him at ten. So you have him a little higher. Why don't you start off? Yeah. So uh, this game was uh, well executed by Gator's opponent, uh, the Philadelphia Scissors and Chimpact. Uh, Gator uh, once again. I mean, you you know what it is about these games is that they look very Smogon singles to me. I don't know why. <laughs> it's just very. I, I see a lot of. Uh, let me pull up my notes here. I see a lot of, of common uh, common occurrences. Uh, honestly, the uh, the shed shell on uh, on heat ran. We we've seen that multiple times before in the past. It, it's it's very. If the team has a duck trio, it's going to be shed shell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very common yeah. to be running uh, shed shell on four times weaknesses when you, the opposing team has a duck trio. Very nice prediction uh, from Chimp to go for the pursuit, uh, knowing that it would be uh, shed shell. That was really cool. Um, about Gator, I mean, I don't have too much to say. I don't think his prep was terrible. Uh, I think it just uh, came down to. Uh, Chimp playing better in the end. Uh, mm -hmm. I like Chimp's sets. I do have a lot to say about Chimp uh, when we get a little bit further, but uh, I want to see, again, more creativity. Uh, I want to see surprise sets. I want to see more light screen into baton pass from the Puku Muku, uh, things like that. So what do you, what do you have on Gator? I, I just have to agree. It's ridiculous how standard his prep was this week. Like, his most creative set was an offensive Tran with Shed Show, which was the most obvious bring in this match. Yeah. Like, it, it, it was literally his only Heatran set this week that he could have brought. So, he, he needs... I just need to see that little bit of more creativity. I mean, I just feel like he... he if you're going up against a guy like Chimp, who's proven in the format, who's a very, very good player, you have to catch him off guard. And you're not going to catch Chimp off guard with standard... Smogon sets for the most part like just just for example he had a he had a life orb mammoth swine if he had not run adamant run naive put hp fire on the mammoth swine he could have done 75 min to uh his fortress to chimp's fortress and then that wouldn't have allowed him to late game come in on mammoth swine to fortress and i don't know if he spun or got his rocks up but I believe he spun. He, yeah he spun and he basically beat out the mammoth swine 1v1 and it's just that little bit of innovation I need to see from Gator that I'm just not. It's The GBA is a very competitive, and so if you're going up against guys like this, you just got to do that little extra thing. Obviously, Gator's a great player, but Chimp, I, he just outplayed him this game. Gator, 
I, he's a good player. I, I think it's just his prep that's holding him back. I, he really couldn't switch into Chimp this game. He did almost pull it off with the Pukumaku at the end, but Chimp basically in control the whole game. So I have that. That's why I have Gator so low. Yeah, it's the same reason for me. I mean, he he did lose, so he's uh, he's a little bit lower this week. Uh, I think it's really just the creativity that that's what's got to come. But that comes with time, you know. Uh, Envy, mm -hmm. we saw it immediately because Envy is just heat master, uh, and Chimp uh, Chimp does have a little bit of a creative side. To be fair, though, Envy was helping Dan the season before, so he had at least prepping experience. In yeah, exactly. Format. You see, so that's Gator uh, is coming in blind, so it will take some time. But I have absolutely. confidence once he gets it, he will have it. So yeah, same here. Absolutely. So moving on from Gator, uh, next up we have, uh, this is one of our, our biggest drops, I believe, mm -hmm, uh, this week. And we have John and uh, Pokemon and the New Orleans Pelipers. Uh, I'll start it off. John just, uh, he, he had nothing for this game. Uh, honestly, he just, uh, he let, it, it's kind of like Dan, he let his biggest offensive threat, which was Gudra this week, uh, surprisingly enough. Uh, go down way too early. That thing could have done, done a lot of damage uh, if he... I mean, the prediction uh, into the muck uh, didn't really make a huge difference. If he would have earthquaked, it would have still gotten the uh, the figgy, uh, figgy berry regardless because it was gluttony. Uh, so that didn't make a huge impact uh, on the end result of the game. Uh, but he did let it take damage. Uh, he did let it go down way too early. Uh, the Jolteon not being Volt Absorb, I understand. Uh, there was hidden power ground on uh, on the Magna Zone on MV side, but just like quick feet uh, didn't make much sense. Uh, there's just a, a conglomerate of things. There was a lot of 50 50s that John just did not get right uh, throughout this game, uh, and it's just uh, it was it was really sad to see uh, such a huge huge drop for John this week. What do you got on it? I mean, we can't sugarcoat this. John got tossed. GG, it's Envy, you know? <laughs> GG, mean, it's Envy. There's no sugar. John would tell you that he got tossed this week. His prep and play were not at the level I expect from him, or I think that he expects from himself, if I'm being honest. However, this could be a little bit of a wake-up call. Kick John into overdrive. We'll see. Again, next week could be big for how if John responds from this loss, because he just got... This could have been a 5-0 if Envy had wanted to preserve the differential. But his prep this week, man, it was just mm -hmm. it was just bad. I mean, I mean, I don't want to just say that because like hindsight 2020, but like Life Orb Sneasel, besides Muck, it two shot everything on Envy's team. Basically every mod he could have potentially brought. All he needed was low kick, icicle crash, and knockoff, and he could have gotten rid of the figgy berry on the Muck. Yep. Not bringing that, especially when your opponent has a Dragonite and a Landorus to uh, Therian. Is crazy to me because you saw how much damage Gudra was doing, which is ground ice coverage, which Envy's team is extremely weak to. Uh, I, 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 don't under believe, I don't believe Envy brought uh, E speed on his D Knight either. Yeah, I, he was a special mixed variant. Yeah, with uh, Thunder EQ and uh, mm -hmm. Fly MZ Hurricane. So he really could have just cleaned Envy's team. Like, um, I will address this. I'll address that with Envy, actually. I'm not even going to talk about it now. But he just over prepped for rain. He addressed that. That's good. Knowing your mistakes is the first step to fixing mm -hmm. them. I understand the Jolteon not having Volt Absorb. I don't agree with it. You're, look at John's team. He could not switch into Magnezone no matter what he tried. So even having that little pivot into Jolteon so you can outspeed it the next turn and fire off a Volt Switch into something that can potentially take a Prediction hit is better than just having your Jolteon take damage after damage after damage. He did bring in some stuff that put in work. The Gudra was fine. The Skarm was okay. It wasn't all bad. He's, he has the right ideas. I don't necessarily think Scarf Bulu was right this week. I thought just Nature's Madness would have been better personally because you look at uh, Envy's team, his Bulu switch-ins are Muck, Dragonite, both lack reliable recovery. Well, Dragonite not so much, but you get Rocks up and then Stone Edge will kill that thing. But I just don't understand the biggest thing. Why was it not Swords Dance Scallopede? I called this out last week. If something can outspeed everything on Envy's team, and get set up, it can destroy Envy. Plus one Scullipede destroyed Envy. If Rocks were up, it one-shot everything. He would have to pivot around his lander so many times just to avoid it, but even plus one non-adamant life orb Scullipede Aqua Tail to a Scarf Landorus, this, I don't know, I remember Envy's EV spread, but just four defense Landorus, 109 to 129%. If he could have ever gotten an SD up with Scullipede, he won. The game was over. And he didn't bring a well, set I mean, that just destroyed he, him. He still had the Sash Zam, 
in the back. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you break the sash. Like, I mean, there's obviously steps you have to take to ensure the sweep, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think not, I think uh, MV was not bringing on to the, the set, Zan basically. It's just my biggest Scalopede. critique. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and the biggest thing for me also, there was a point in the game, uh, if I recall correctly, where John had a trade off with his Skarm and the Empoleon, and he ultimately ended up losing the trade off leaving rocks up on his side and not getting rocks up on Envy's side. So, because they both they were both uh, stealth rock setters and I believe they were also both defoggers. Uh, so, you need rocks up when there's a Lando there, a Magna Zone that you have to slightly chip away gradually, and especially a Dragonite that's going to conserve its scale. Like, you have to make sure that rocks stay up. Uh, and he wasn't even able to accomplish that. He just let the Empoleon take out his, his Skarmory, which is really unfortunate to me. Uh, I would have really liked to see him keep up rocks, or at least just spam rocks and make sure the Empoleon died to burn. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, John not able to uh, show us the best of his abilities this week. Uh, so we have him down at number 9. He dropped from number 2 from last yeah. week. So, But uh, I just think John was overly aggressive this game, over-predicting a lot. Envy just basically had to play straightforward, but I don't want John to play too safely. Yeah. Like, I, if, if you just get into the mindset of, I over-predicted like four turns this game, I just have to play it straightforward. That's also how you lose games. You have to find the middle ground between playing aggressively and playing safe. Like, know when you can take risks. John did not need to take risks in a lot of the situations he was in, especially with Gudra, and it cost him the game. It's a lot like Battle or X last season, and let this be <laughs> uh, a note to all uh, coaches, uh, if you're a new player in draft league format, uh, or if you're a new coach in the GBA or any league in your own league, uh, make sure uh, that you find your balance and you find it quickly uh, between knowing when to be aggressive and when to play it safe. Uh, because if you continue a trend of, uh, of making the wrong play at the wrong time and you're not able to correct that quickly, uh, then you're you're gonna end up with losses, and this is what happened to John this week. Uh, he couldn't find his balance. Uh, the prep wasn't amazing either. Uh, he definitely should have brought the Sneasel. We looked at the matchup and we, we worried why did Sneasel not come to this game. Uh, so if you're a draft league player, if you if you're new to the format, uh, make sure you find your balance quickly between making aggressive plays and playing safe. That is definitely. my advice to you. So, but we can't talk about John all day. No, nope, sure he nope. wouldn't want us to. <laughs> Absolutely um, not. Let's move on. So we can also we can either talk about Crimson or Cooper next. Uh, let's go with Cooper because he's the closest to. We both have, have him at seven. So all right, we'll talk about Cooper first. So he lost this week to Tom. Um, he had a bad matchup. Um, okay. I I don't know with Cooper this week. I didn't have a problem with most of his prep actually. I just think Tom's offense had a really good matchup. Uh, he didn't bring his only hit monthly counter on the team, which was a Fizz Def Reuni. He brought Spadef, so Cooper, Mark there. Uh, Swello, very good bring, very good set bring this week. But he sacked it so early, and sacking it, he addressed it in his video, was not the play. He needed that thing to revenge hit monthly, first of all, and just break Tom's team down. And losing it for just like a, for like 50% on Vaporeon was definitely not worth it. I think this game just came down to Cooper in at least in his calm or I don't it wasn't a live calm it was a post calm uh, in his video he kind of knew the plays Tom was going to make but he either a didn't have the prep to capitalize on it or b he did not make the play he needed to to capitalize it so Coop needs to play a little bit more aggressively towards getting uh when especially when he's down in the hole like that because he did get put down in the hole very quickly this game but yeah, Coop, I, I don't want to fault him too much because, again, the matchup was not in his favor without a doubt this game, but uh, you got to mark him here. He did not play his best game. Yeah, and I think when you're when you're staring down a uh, Hippowdon, uh, sorry, a Hitmonlee with your Hippowdon, I think the uh, there's no room for over-predicting because that thing is going to run straight through you. You have to click Earthquake there, Coop. Uh, Especially when it's the biggest threat to your team exactly. standing right in you, front of you. you. Even, even if it loses you momentum, you have to get rid of uh, threats like that. And uh, even if Tom switches out, you you, you click Earthquake every single time. So that, that I, was... I honestly don't know. Sorry to interrupt, but I don't know why uh, Coop didn't bring a Shell Smash Cloister. I understand Tom has a Vaporeon. Yeah. But like you slap HP Grass or something on that thing. You could probably do a lot of damage to a Vaporeon at plus two, and he especially could have, since he Vape was Tom's pivot into everything. He yeah. could have worn it down really easily, and it definitely could have swept Tom's team. I know 
it might not have had the best matchup on paper, but you know, hindsight 2020, all that. But you know, that was just something I noticed that a uh, shell. I don't know why Coop hasn't brought Shell Smash Cloister yet. Yeah, no, Scarf he, like, he likes set. to get creative with the Cloister. Uh, but that's the thing about Vaporeon that you have to notice, uh, especially if, if uh, anybody watching is drafting it, is that it walls too much. It, it fills in too many walling rolls and it gets worn down extremely quickly, faster than you think it would, even though it has Wish Protect and a very high HP stat. So if you identify that as your opponent's only wall to a lot of your threats, then you can capitalize on that. And unfortunately, Cooper wasn't able to this week. So that's, uh, that's pretty much how it ends up. I moved him down two spots. You moved him down a full four, I believe. So. Yeah, I was pretty crazy this week because basically I had to just I had to just step back. I basically had to just step back from last week and be like, all right, I got the two and O teams, I got the O and two teams. Where where do I want to put the rest of the coaches at this point in the season? Yeah. You know, that's just kind of was my thought process going into this week. Yeah, we we didn't really discuss where we had uh, our our co where we had the coaches this week uh, with each other before we started recording. So we're kind of finding <laughs> this out for the first time. Um, so. Let's uh, actually talk about George next, because you have him at 8, I have him at 6, and can I just say one thing before we start? Yep. Play a game where Hax is not influencing it, George. Please, <laughs> so I can honestly power rank you. Yeah, it would be, it would be very nice of you to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I, he got the Steve treatment that I gave Steve last week. I didn't move him up. I moved him up one spot. I moved I moved Steve up a few spots. Kind of the same thing. But Hacks not a big factor this week as it was versus Steve. I want to move on from that because there was a lot of disagreement last week over that. But Hacks definitely influenced this game. I I don't know if it was honestly a like 50-50 with Charty or Pasho Berry on the Volcarona. I think Charty would have been better because you look at uh, George's team. Uh, you look at... Uh, Lars's sorry, team. Lars's team, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Krona doesn't have that great of a matchup. I mean, it's good, but Tank Chomp kind of very much scares it out. Um, and you look at uh, Georgia Sweepers, Superior and Volcarona, Scarf uh, Nihiligo stops both of them. He brought the uh, uh, Kevia Berry on the Superior, but not the Charty Berry on Volcarona. I feel like he kind of half the prep there, you know? Yeah, now you see, the thing with these games, and I said it about Steve last week when he went up against George, is that uh, if you're going to get hacks in your favor... You have to play off of it and and try to win with with what the game deals you as a hand, uh, and I think George did that perfectly. He yeah, just I, with the muse I I don't well. wanna, like I said I don't want to short George uh, too much, it, but really, like really, really well the obviously the Iron Tail miss. Yeah, he did play very well after the fact. The Iron Tail miss obviously mattered. No one yeah, is exactly. doubting that. Um, but I think I, hindsight twenty twenty, Lars probably did have a little bit team matchup on myself here. I probably underrated his team in the draft analysis. Uh, I'll take the blame for that one, but. Uh, I thought George could have brought Mian Shao. It looked like it put in so much work versus Lars's team. That's kind of the Mon that is very good versus Lars's kind of team is a Mon, you know, with powerful stab and U-turn, especially for the Latias, especially when it's a fighting type. Uh, it can definitely deal with those threats. But, yeah, George, I, I think he risked his win con too early with Volcarona, and that definitely cost him. I, I don't really know how to rate this game, again, because Hacks influenced it. So, George... Don't win or lose based on hacks. Just win or lose. Period. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's we want. We want to move you up or down. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but we want to know what to do with you in power rankings, bro. So please just have a hacks list game. We want to see that uh, from now on, if possible. Uh, but that's pretty much it for George. There's not much to say about this match, and I don't think we're gonna have too much to cover with uh, on Lars's end either. Uh, but uh, let's move on. I think we can cover... Uh, let's cover Crimson now. Yeah, let's, let's do cover Crimson, Crimson now. Uh, because you have him at number 8, but I have him at number 5, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll let you start talking about him. Uh, first of all, slow clap. Slow clap. Well done. First 6-0 of the season, yep. albeit benefited by hacks um, for the 6-0. It's also but, Crimson's uh, first 6-0 of his career. Yes. So. so very solid to him there. Yep. But yeah, a, a lot. A, like, again, not too much to be said. We covered most of it. Dual Dance Cobalt was very nice prep. Saw it put in a lot of work to capitalize. Specs Mag, great call. Played very risky with it, and it almost cost him extremely. Luckily, it didn't. Um, but yeah, he used Mag, uh, since it was alive, very well to get momentum. He used Torn to get momentum, revenge kill things perfectly, and just got Cobalt in on the right things, set up and won. That's all I got to say. Good job, Crimson. Yeah, no, absolutely. He played extremely well. I, we're seeing great play from him this season, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really loving it. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping he makes playoffs. I'm really uh, curious to see what he can do in playoffs, because that, that's where it gets really tough. Um, he played even better than last week, in my opinion. 
Uh, he made necessary doubles as well in points in the game, uh, where he caught Geo off guard. He was able to maintain his momentum with the Magneton uh, you, the entire game. He's been using Magneton extremely well. Even last week, we saw it. Uh, at some point, he switched out his Magneton in case the Finny was offensive with Hydro Pump, and it was. He went into Slowking because he, he lost nothing by going into it. Uh, I just really like the way the Crimson's playing. That's why I have him so high up, uh, and I want to continue seeing this. And uh, he I just I have him a little lower because of the fact that I do believe he would have gotten a little... It wouldn't have been as close a game if Mono had done his prep correctly yeah. last week. That's why I just want to see a little bit more from Crimson. He did, definitely showed me a lot this week, and like we said last week, Crimson is here. He's no longer an improving coach. He is an improved coach who everyone should be scared of every week. Yeah, and uh, I'm really liking his team. I really, I'm really, i really liking uh, the Magneton, the Steel types, the Magneton Cobalion core. Very nice, and I want to... It's I wanna working see, well for him. Yeah, I want to see it continue to put in work. He is the Detroit Steel Wings, after all, so... Yep. There you go. So we can either talk about MV or Chimpack next. It's up to you. I think um, I think we hit Chimp first. All right. So I have Chimp at four. You have Chimp at six. Yep. I, I just don't have a lot to critique Chimp on this week. I really don't. He played and prepped very, very well. Pursuit Doug Trio, while uh, Shed Shell Heatran is obvious, that Pursuit Doug Trio and making the play right there, very, very solid prep. Uh, he would not have killed the Heatran if it had not switched out. So that was very, very innovative, very, very well played. Um, Scarf Volk was fine, but maybe Specs would have been better because Gator's team isn't exactly speedy, and Webs will just cancel out your uh, Scarf anyway, mm -hmm. and you could almost Oko everything on Gator's team by picking the right move. I don't know. Maybe you run Sub SD Sol uh, Sub uh, Sunny Day Solar Beam, deal with the uh, counter, but uh -huh. you know that's that's Jar's set, so that's he's gonna claim that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the Savali Azu prepped well. He was very composed the whole game. Had a plan to win, executed it, and did it. I mean, I don't have a lot to critique him on this week. Yeah, very, no, very well he done. He played well. I like the Azu set. Uh, but you, you see, the, the one thing about Chimp, and uh, I was uh, going to say it when we talked about Gator, but I was looking at his team builder, and I would like to see a little more EV optimization. And I'm going to get a lot of heat for this because Chimp is a great player, and I know he's a very good ladder player as well. Uh, but there are some things that I noticed. For example, his Volcanion. Uh, Scarf is fine if you want to run Scarf, uh, if you feel that it's the best set uh, that week. I really like the combination of Steam Eruption plus Scald. It was good coverage. Uh, kind of like how... Um, Steam Eruption plus Scald? Yeah, my had, friend? Hello? Yeah, he, had, he had Steam Eruption plus Scald. Uh, I know, I was just making fun of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's kind of like how King Joe runs Hydro Pump and Surf. But, yeah. uh, no, it's, it's, it was fine. The only thing is, he could have shifted a few EVs out of his speed because I went into uh, a calc and I looked up exactly how speedy Latios was at level 50. I believe it hits 118. And his Volcanion was EV'd to outspeed the Latios, but by quite a bit. Um, he could have ran 228 speed instead of running 252. Uh, and he would have had enough uh, investment to pour it into either HP or uh, Fizz Def, wherever he wanted it. And while those, what, I think 34, uh, 36, 40 EVs may not seem like a lot, they might eventually, throughout a game, allow you to live a roll at some point. So I would like to see a little bit better EV optimization. I still feel like a lot of the sets are, are looking standard on his end. Uh, I know he can do better than that. We've seen great things from Chimp in the past before. Uh, if we're, we're looking at last season, things like speed pass into, uh, what was it, Life Orb, Sheer Force, uh, Steelix? Uh, Steelix, that yeah. Was, that was really cool. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of thing, I, the things I want to see again this season. It's a little bit tougher with his team because his team is very straightforward. Uh, it's kind of just like Volcanion breaks the stuff and then Azu cleans them up. Uh, that, that's that's kind of what I'm seeing. But uh, no, I, li I like this play. Uh, again, uh, coming back to the Pursuit play, uh, amazing on his part, predicting the switch out in, uh, on Heat Ren and uh, making sure that it went down uh, was, was great. Uh, I would have liked to see, this is what I forgot to mention when we were talking about Gator, I would have liked to see Sucker Punch on the uh, Galvantula to get rid of the... Um, that would have been the pretty Ductrio. cool. Like if, if it's if it's choice locked, it goes for earthquake on the first turn. You're sashed. Uh, you bring it down to whatever amount of health, uh, and then you hit it with a sucker punch, and you knock out the Pokemon that got three kills. So yeah. that would have been cool. Uh, and I think that Chimp uh, might have reconsidered running Band 
Uh, in that case, and might, might have instead run just a, a different set so that he could Sucker Punch the Galvantula first. But I guess he figured that Sucker Punch wasn't a good bring on Galvantula. Either way, I think Chimp played a very good game. Uh, overall, he, he did what he needed to do to win. That's always respectable. So, uh, spinning at the right time, everything just very solid. Yeah. There's not much to say. So, are we ready to move on to GG It's MV? <laughs> yes, we are ready to move on to MV, who is no longer... Uh, who no longer has a bad report card. Uh, uh, no, he, MV, MV, MV definitely studied for his test this time around. Yeah, yeah, and he can show his parents uh, his good grades. He can go home, finally. Yep. He's been sleeping on the streets for a few <laughs> nights, so it's been rough. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think MV uh, showed us what he can do with his team. Uh, I think he had a decent team matchup. Uh, I, don't yeah. think it, I don't think it was skewed in any direction, to be honest, in that match. I, uh, I just, on team matchup, uh, Mag... Very, very solid versus oh, yeah. John's team. Oh, yeah. Very. It, it, it has such a good matchup versus John's team. Yeah. You, you're forced to bring a Shed Shell Skarm against, exactly. uh, against Mag, and you, you know that the Skarm's not going to have any recovery. Instead, he brings a defensive uh, Magnezone to be able to deal with the... Or an Assault Vest Magnezone uh, to be able to deal with the Jolteon, which is very good on his part because he knew how much damage the Jolteon could do to his team. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the Magnezone was also EV to take a knock or a low kick from uh, from a Life Orb Sneasel. So, uh, very good prep on his part. He kept the Sash intact, even though it never came into play. Uh, he did, again, what he needed to do to win. A lot of pressure from Lando. Magnezone put in the most work this game, I feel like. Uh, I'm not even sure if it picked up the most kills. I would have to check really quickly uh, to see what on his team uh, got the most kills. Well, while you do that, I'll give my opinion. Yeah. So... Envy played prepped very very well. The reason I don't have Envy higher was I think this game was more John shooting himself in the foot. Like I don't want to discredit Envy. He played prepped how he needed to to win that game. Mm -hmm. But I think John shooting himself in the foot with his prep this week was definitely a little bit of a factor. Um, the prep was solid. He built a very very nice muck set that just took hits from everything. John was surprised how bulky that thing was. He could not break it. Um, Scarfiachi Lando again, but it worked. Can't strike him. I. It's just when it's not a Zemon, it's very tough to not bring Scarf or Yachi. Um, but I I get that... I think people misunderstood me when I said that his team was bad against... It was weak to fast electric types. I didn't... What I meant, didn't mean by that was that he wouldn't be able to stop a fast electric type or at least switch into them. Envy's team just is not a team that wants momentum against it. It is slow and it does not have walls. So, when a mon that and the best mons are doing that are fast electric types. So just imagine what John could have done if he would have pr predicted less with his Gudra, chipped the Magnezone more with Jolteon, and once it was chipped more, used his Sneasel to two-shot everything on his team. Or he could have gone into Scully sooner and just started putting work in on MV's team when the rocks were still up. I he just he wasn't using the momentum to its optimal peak this game because I truly do believe that I will stand by the point that I made. Envy's team is not has trouble with fast electric types. I'm not saying a fast electric type is going to 6-0 Envy. I'm saying that it will provide his opponents a lot of momentum because you saw it this game. He did not want to risk his landers. Mag was his play every time. John over predicted and it cost him a lot in this game, just over predictions. Like I said, I don't want to see him not be aggressive, but at the same time, you just got to find that middle ground again. Yeah, no, I, but I, I have MV a little bit higher up because I really uh, liked... I took down all of his sets. Like, I wrote them all down. I have a sheet in front of me. Magnezone actually, actually, by the way, did get three kills. Uh, it was the kill leader in this game. Um, and I love this set, honestly. Uh, the, the Sludge Wave on Lando T, the Assault Vest Magnezone, uh, the Empoleon was perfect. It had Toxic for the Milotic. Uh, the D Knight was super interesting with Flying MZ Hurricane, the mix set uh, with agility for uh, an endgame sweeper. Uh, the Sash Zam, very standard uh, with T Wave, Gleam, Shadow Ball, and Psychic, but it was it did it was there to do what it needed to do. Uh, the Muck with Figgy Berry and Gluttony. I think I think his prep was phenomenal. Uh, no, it, his prep was very, very, very it's good. A, it's week. exactly what we've seen from Envy in the past, and this is what I wanted to see to put him higher up. And this me, is all me as well. This is all I needed, and he he's number uh, number three on my list, uh, purely because I I just have like different opinions on certain coaches, which I think we're about to get to, uh, in a second. I think we're about to talk about uh, your Lars. number your number three and my number four. Yeah. So MV, good job, great grades, man. Keep it up. Uh, keep doing well. We'll in see school. if you can keep up that we'll, report card, my dude. Yeah, we'll we'll see you next week. Make sure you bring your homework. All right. Bring your homework, MV. All right, so, so I have Lars at three. You have him at four, correct? 
Yeah, I have him at four. So I admit it. I, I underrated this team in the post-draft analysis. I don't think it's the best team, but I definitely underrated the offense on it. Um, and I'm probably going to get that's That's your chance, comments. Go go roast me down below. I, Ajar admitted he was wrong. Shocker, I know. Um, but the reason he tops my one and ones is because Lars is probably the only art team you can argue that should be 2-0 at this point. Um, I do, you don't know how the game plays out if he hits that iron tail. You don't. But it looks a lot better for Lars. You don't know if the Mew could have healed up later in the game on something it was faster than. Yep. Uh, like the Dawn fan, for example. It did come in on that. So... I, I don't want to say he would have won, but he would have been in a lot better situation. Um, the only the Scarf Nihiligo was the right set, but Lars, my dude, how is Magirna not number one in the kills ranking? That's all I'm going to ask. Um, if you have a Magirna, you should be 6 0 your opponent every week. That's just a fact. So uh, I'm not seeing it so far. <laughs> but the Decidueye set, a little weird for me. I understand it because it, hits, it stops the Suicune when the rest of his team was not great against it. So I can't really fault him. Uh, he needs to train his Lucario's better, but just very solid prep, very solid play. I I, th I see a lot of good things for Lars. Unfortunately, if you, he is in the division with George and Mono, that is not a fun division to be in. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sure he doesn't like that either. Because I believe he plays Mono this upcoming week, so yeah. we'll see what he can do versus a team we both regard very highly. But I, I have confidence in Lars this season, I really do. Yeah, I'm just uh, actually looking at his Magirna set right now. I was a little confused by the end game uh, from Lars, which is why uh, I have him at number four. Uh, I was if if your play is to spadef drop the uh, the the Mew anyway, you should probably go for shift gear first to make sure you can outspeed the rest of the team afterwards, uh, because the superior can just come in in revenge afterwards. I think he was a little on tilt. After, yeah, pro at probably, that point. and I, I understand that. I've been in that position before, so I, I see where he's coming from. Uh, but I would have definitely uh, gone for the shift gear there because if he does get a crit or a spit F drop on the first shadow ball and lives two EQs, Magirna can actually sweep in the end game. It could have. So I would have liked to see that for sure. Uh, but I think uh, Lars just played an overall good game. He he got hacked pretty badly, uh, I have to say. Even the, the Suicune uh, critting the Rotom because uh, it could have lived. He uh, might need a ritual of his own, like uh, Battler X. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, no, for sure. Um, he needs to ward off the evil hacks. It's not been nice so far. <laughs> We, uh, we, we're looking forward to see uh, Lars continue to play well uh, this season, and I know he's a fantastic player. I've played him myself before in the past. I know how good he is, uh, and uh, I want to I continue seeing that. You just love to plug yourself, don't you? What are you talking about? That wasn't a plug. Dash I'm just shame, saying, I'm just Aster. saying that I've played Dash against Lars, shame. and I... Okay, Jar, leave. <laughs> no, but, leave? Uh, but... This man tells me to leave. Get out. I was here first. Yeah, you were, but... and No, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that he's a fantastic player, and I'm really looking forward to seeing him for the rest of the season, so... Uh, I'm just giving you shit, kid. All right, moving on to our uh, to both of our number two. We both have the same coach at number two. Uh, obviously, the, the way that we position this, uh, we tried to avoid keeping it uh, the same as standings, but... Ultimately, that's what it's going to end up This week being. is just a little tough for that. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, it's hard, but uh, we both have Callum at number two, Hoodlum Scrafty, and the Alola Athletic, if you want to cover that. Yeah, so Callum is on thin ice for me at number two, because I'm going to be honest, I don't think he's the second best player in the league. He's faced two teams who are both in the bottom three, so he's on thin ice at number two. He's going to definitely have to keep up his wins in order to remain at number two, but I'm going to leave him here for now. Mm -hmm. uh, a few things, this is just a little bit like, he just needs, it's just, I don't know if it's just, I want to say general Pokemon knowledge, but when a Crest clicks U-Turn, don't think, oh, he's running U-Turn Crest. Think, okay, that's Zoroark. I had a problem <laughs> with that. Yeah. Uh, that, tr that triggered me deep down. It really did. But yeah. uh, a few notes, I don't like the AV drill. That was not, I would have went with leftovers mm -hmm. because you don't need an AV to wall circuitry. You just need some spadef investment, and if your leftovers, you ha can hand run SD and handle crest better. Also, shadow uh, the SD he ran shadow claw earthquake hits both Kofag and Cresselia harder than shadow claws, which is something to note there. Don't get too caught up in super effective damage. Yeah, I think Shaman also should have been leftovers. It would have helped him walls uh, Kartana and Zorkatree better because he did again. You don't need an AV to wall the Zorkatree with a Shaman. Just a little bit of spadef investment, um, but. Overall, everything else I liked. He played perfectly how he needed to. Roar on Titar, great. 
he played the the rest of his prep was very very solid sass espion to just avoid the sweep from his team he prepped for his sweeps very well because sweep does have a team that likes to set up very very nice uh, Roaring when he needed to, saving himself the game, making the right plays in order to ensure the victory. I have to give Callum credit where it's due. This week, he played, and besides the two sets I talked about, prepped very, very well. Yeah, no, same here. I think uh, Callum's showing us uh, that he's pretty decent. You did say uh, he beat two teams that are in the bottom three, so uh, keep that in mind, guys. But uh, no, Callum definitely deserves the number two position this week. Uh, I think he's shown us that he can definitely prep. Uh, he identified that Steve's team, like you said, uh, was full of sweepers, brought Roar on two Mons, brought a Sash Espeon to make sure that he didn't lose to Kartana. It was just, uh, I, I really liked his, his prep and his play. He, he did what he needed to do to win his uh, trading off his T-Tar for the Cresselia. Uh, earlier I said that Steve trading his Cresselia for the T-Tar uh, was good on his end, but ultimately it, it ended up favoring Callum uh, more in the end. And uh, no, uh, I... I'm just happy to put him at number two. Honestly, I like seeing a new coach this high up. Yeah, um, very good to prep on Callum again, running Flamethrower over Fire Punch. Uh, if you do the calcs yourself, Fire Punch does not kill Kartana. Flamethrower does. Yep. So I know some people are saying Fire Punch over Flamethrower. Uh, no, Flamethrower. It's Kartana. It's Spit F is garbage. Do you check the coach's comments? I do. Wow. I, ch I check everything, Aster. I'm thorough. All right. All right. Well, okay. I'm and I watch the that. weekly recaps. Yeah. Shout out to Spastic and Confusion. Yo. All right, so moving on. Shade to... across the series. <laughs> moving uh, over to number one. Uh, of course, you guys all know this team was uh, at number one for I us I would just last like week. to point out my notes just say, just suck his dick, basically. That's all I have. Um, that's that's what he asked us to do, right? Yeah, that's that's what that's what, that's what I'm just here for. I was about at this to point. make some really obscene sounds, but I will refrain. <laughs> all right. You'll refrain from that on your second video. Maybe week 13. Possibly. Maybe week 13 <laughs> we'll see it. All right, so uh, of course we have the Tampa Bay Lux Rays, uh, Monotui, and uh, Mono, just showing us again why he uh, is here and why he did so well last season and why he continues to be one of the most threatening league players uh, around, even uh, in other leagues. We've seen him. Uh, he is fantastic. Oh, we've seen a lot of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, he's, uh, I believe he won a championship right before joining the GBA. Uh, he was a power rankings analyst for one week <laughs> before he replaced Gubs last season. And uh, he has been on a tear ever since, and it hasn't stopped. So yeah. uh, this is, uh, I mean, he just, he, he controlled the game. He identified that his mill tank was an ultimate wall to stop top, uh, and it did an amazing job. Uh, he got off necessary damage on Pokemon. He just, what, what do you have in your notes? Like, is there anything I, I already told you the entirety of my notes. Um, but <laughs> uh, a quick note, I believe Mono has... Uh, I crimson. I, he, I would say he beat the 16 team, so we're not going to just like... I'm, I'm pretty much on the Mono train because I know Mono is a great battler. His prep proved well he, well that he is probably rightfully the number one at this point. He's 2-0, and and he is just, like you said, on a tear. I, very nice prep. The buzz will very well made to destroy Tup's wall core. I think he had matchup, but I mean, it, with matchup you have to win. There's a lot of pressure on you, and Mono did just that. Played the game well. Uh, Scarf Rose Raid, terrific bring on his yep. part because... When you look at the team matchup, Roserade is good offensively, but it did not have Leech Seed. So, I maybe would have ran Scarf Leech Seed. I don't think, uh, I think he just needed the Grass Poison Fairy coverage. I don't know what his last move was. Maybe it was Leech Seed? Perhaps. I don't remember, honestly. I don't know. He'd have to tell us, but... Uh... He'd have to tell us. Um, but, yeah, because if Blissey was brought to this game, while I know that Buzzbowl destroyed Tup's wall core, so getting that in at any point was good, but if Blissey was brought to this game... Roserade would have put in zero work because it cannot be that's that set cannot be Blissey in any universe. Basically, no Roserade set can beat Blissey in any universe. So, the fact that he brought that Roserade because he knew Tup would not bring Blissey with team matchup just shows that he is knowing what his he's not just prepping for his opponent's team. He's prepping for what he knows his opponent is and is going to not bring, and that is why Mono is such a threatening player. That's what's not just part. Absolutely, like why why would you bring Blissey when there's a Buzzwool and a Zygarde right there? Like mm -hmm. it's it's because that Zygarde I believe sets up subs. Blissey cannot break unless it's running Ice Beam. Exactly. So at that so... point, it can't touch uh, Buzzwool. Yep. Because it doesn't have Seismic Toss. Yep. So no, yeah. uh, ama amazing from Mono. Honestly, the Rosary able to clean up in the late game, and uh, I'm. I'm, I'm uh, like I said, like you said, uh, he did take down Top, who is our number 16. We have to keep that in mind. But uh, if Mono continues to play like this, uh, I can't identify a player. Uh, maybe, perhaps, 
uh, I would say Chimp uh, that would be able to uh, to beat him based on team matchup alone and and the, the amount of skill that Mono is showing us right now. Uh, I'm really curious to see who's going to be the first person to beat him. Yeah, that the 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 top the top five definitely anyone versus anyone can win. I'm every, actually just li let's look at the league in general. Anyone can beat anyone in this league on any given day. For fuck's sake, we got 12 one and one teams in our rankings, guys. This is going to be a fantastic rest of the GBA season. Like this is probably one of the most competitive, if not the most competitive year we have seen in the history of the GBA. Except for Steve. Except for Steve. <laughs> we love you, I'm Steve. I'm kidding, Steve. We love you. Yeah. Hopefully he gets this far that he heard us say that. <laughs> oh, shit. He just clicked off right there. Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah, that's that's, uh, that's pretty much our power rankings for this week, guys. Uh, like I said, I will be replacing Rob uh, from here on out. So uh, let us know what you, how you, you would have placed the teams uh, this week. Well, you see, Aster, I'm a stall player. So when I have to look at these rankings in total, I'm just fucking kidding with you. <laughs> It had to come once, didn't almost it? Almost made it through a whole video, eh? Yeah, almost. I, I didn't want to do it anymore because it's not earlier. funny anymore. I, I, I didn't want to do it. I can't believe somebody called you out and, like a vegan. A vegan. Especially when I said satirical in the video. Yeah. But I hope Mono appreciated the nice fellatio this uh, <laughs> week. I hope that this is the second and hopefully not the last time he comes first for two guys at the same time um, in general. So, but overall, a lot of great coaches, a lot of great players, a lot of great plays. Make sure you stay tuned for more content coming from the GBA channel. Astor, do you have anything else to say? No, that's pretty much it, guys. Make sure to uh, check out all the coaches in the description down below. Uh, not to miss any action in the coming weeks. Uh, with all of these one-in-one -one teams, it's, uh, it's really exciting to see who is going to take the lead and who's going to fall behind from here on out. So make sure not to miss any of that. And we will see you next week on Power Rankings. See you later. Later, guys.